Okay, hi everyone and welcome to the AOML Virtual Open House. My name is Heidi Van Buskirk and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is brought to you by NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory here in Miami, Florida. And it's designed to help you get to know AOML and some of our incredible experts that we have here at our lab. To celebrate Earth Day, which is today, happy Earth Day everybody, we're bringing you an inside look to some of the groundbreaking research that our scientists are doing. Throughout these webinars so far, we've explored hurricanes, ocean currents, extreme weather, and today we'll be talking about coastal ecosystems. We'll be diving into our ocean to explore coral reefs, talk about red tides, and learn a little bit about ocean forensics and how our scientists are using new technologies to promote healthy ecosystems. We have a few guidelines before I welcome our first speaker. First of all, you're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure that everybody can hear our speaker. However, there is a questions box on your GoToWebinar panel. Please write your questions for our speakers there. We encourage you to ask questions as we go along and our speakers will be taking time to answer them at the end of their presentations. We may not be able to get to everybody's questions, but we will do our best to answer as many as possible. Now it's time for me to turn it over to our first speaker, Chris Kelbel, who will tell you a bit about ocean chemistry research that we conduct here at AOML and a little bit more about red tides. Chris, I'm throwing it over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna be talking to you today about what we do in the Ocean Chemistry and Ecosystems Division at AOML. And I wanna start by introducing myself. I'm Chris Kelbel. I am the director of the division there and I just got the job a couple months ago. I'm very excited to be there. I have, however, been at AOML for almost, for, for over 20 years now, uh, starting in 1999 in the same division. I got into marine science uh, because it was something I always wanted to do as, as pretty much a fourth grader or so. I got interested in Jacques Cousteau episodes and watched all those that I could get my hands on told my parents I was going to be a marine scientist. And then when I was in fifth grade, I told them I was going to go to the University of Miami uh, for no real good reason at all. And then uh, lo and behold, that's exactly what I ended up doing. I don't think they ever thought that as a 10 year old, I'd actually do what I was telling them I was going to do, but it, it's worked out very well for me. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about what we do in the Ocean Chemistry and Ecosystems Division. We have a few main research areas one of which is to look at how the ocean plays a role in carbon dioxide cycling. So climate change is a big issue in the news right now and in, in our global dialogue. And what we do is look at how the ocean plays a role in the cycling of carbon, both anthropogenic and natural carbon. And a lot of what this results in is ocean acidification, which we'll be hearing uh, several of our speakers speaking about and how it impacts coral reefs. The other uh, key goal we have in the Ocean Chemistry and Ecosystem Division is to look at and characterize, understand, and predict the impact of different pressures on marine ecosystems. And these can be natural pressures like hurricanes and also things that come from the human population like pollution and uh, increasing uh, nutrient levels due to the increased use of fertilizers. And throughout all of our research, we are really aiming to develop products that enhance coastal and marine resilience and sustainability. That's really uh, what NOAA's mission is in this area and what we're trying to do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some one aspect of the oceans that many people don't think about, and it's the microscopic life that lives in our oceans. Many people don't realize, but while the ocean, especially here on Miami Beach, may look clear and blue and, and almost devoid of life, there is tons of life in that, in that drop of water that you see there even. There's over 10 million viruses, a million bacteria, and about a thousand other small organisms and algae in, in just a single drop of water. What I'm showing on the bottom here are some of the phytoplankton that exist in the water. These are just like the plants on land, except for they're single cell, they're microscopic, but they serve the same function. They, they photosynthesize to produce energy and form the base of the food chain. However, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is not just that they form the base of the food chain, in some cases they can be detrimental. And one of the biggest cases we have of this nearby is the Florida red tides that occur on the west uh, coast of Florida. This is formed by a phytoplankton, it's called a dinoflagellate. And you can see two images here of, of a uh, cell from the red tides. And what you see is it's a regular kind of cell. And then what you see in the darker shade there is, is a flagella or a little whip that these things can actually use to move around and they concentrate themselves, forming these red tide blooms. 
And on the right here, you see a, a, an example of those blooms and why they're called red tide. They can really form a bright red color in the ocean when they're blooming like this. And these are important to understand because they, they cause a lot of problems. However, as they've been in the news more and more lately, a lot of discussion has been going on about whether they're getting worse or whether they're a naturally occurring event. And one of the things I think it's important to keep in mind is that they are naturally occurring and they've been documented all the way back to the first Spanish explorers entering Florida when they met the Native Americans and they, they talk about the Native Americans referencing these events and they told us that even in this quote you see here that they used to tell time by the change of seasons and that included a time when fish die which many took to reflect what happens in red tide and some of the worst cases of red tide. So while they, they, they've been here since before Europeans arrived and they are a naturally occurring aspect of the ecosystem, they still might be getting worse. And what we are really trying to understand is these devastating red tide blooms. So the red tide blooms are naturally occurring. They're there almost every year, but there's some years where they're way worse than others, where they're way more intense. These are the years where you hear about the respiratory irritation, where people are having trouble breathing at the beaches, where you have fish die-offs and as you see here sometimes even whale sharks can be Chris I'd hate to interrupt you but I think we're having a little bit of an audio problem while they're sitting on their beach towel. So it really, just over a 13 week period in Fort Myers Beach, we loaded in almost $50 million in losses during this bloom. So overall, you can see a major economic impact. And in the impact on fisheries is what I'm showing here, where you see year at the bottom and the catch for different fishery species on the y-axis. And you can see in the red box during the bloom, these catches dropped dramatically, both for stone crabs, but also for mullet and red grouper. And if you were to follow this out to 2019, it even gets worse. And this is um, a quote from one of the fishermen in the area that I thought was particularly um, important and enlightening. And basically he said his office was on fire. He didn't know it and nobody told him because his bloom was going on. All the fish, I shouldn't say all the fish, but many of the fish were dying and he was still going out there trying to catch fish, but there were no fish to be caught. So our goal of our research into Red tide and AOML is really to increase the resilience of these coastal communities. And we do that by providing better information to the coastal communities, where the blooms are, when they are, what other kind of ecosystem impacts are associated with those blooms. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Better understanding of what causes these devastating blooms. And then with our partners in uh, universities, especially the University of Florida, looking at the socioeconomic impact of these blooms. And ultimately, we want to do all of this to develop forecasts at seasonal to subseasonal scales, so much like your hurricane forecast that you see at the beginning of the season that say it's going to be a bad hurricane season or not that bad of a hurricane season. We want to do the same thing for red tide blooms. So some of the hypotheses we're investigating here is one that these devastating blooms are associated with hypoxia, which are the dead zones. These are areas where the oxygen levels are much lower and oftentimes can't support marine life. Um, the second hypothesis we're looking at is the specific weather and ocean patterns that co-occur precede these devastating blooms and associated hypoxia. And then from these relationships that we can forecast the likelihood of these blooms to occur, and almost as importantly, the likelihood that an existing bloom will end. So how do we do this research? The big answer is partnerships. We go have lots of colleagues in the university system with the state of Florida across NOAA. And we go out and conduct surveys on large research vessels where we take measurements. We also have some of the fishermen we work out work with. They have their own water quality testing equipment that they take out, collect data, send back to us. And we use all this data to better understand what's going on. And as I said, ultimately to create models and create forecasts of these blooms. One of the biggest things that we found uh, was this co-location of hypoxia. So we have found that when there's devastating blooms, when there's blooms that cause massive fish kills that have negative economic impacts, there's almost always low oxygen associated with them. And this is showing what occurred during the October 2018 bloom, where you can see this large area of low oxygen water. And to show you what this does, 
uh, I wanted to show you a couple movies. This first one is what fish behave fish behavior in kind of normal oxygen conditions. And you can see the fish are swimming around. They're acting normally. They're behaving as you'd expect fish to behave. They're kind of picking at things at the bottom, moving pretty quickly, just acting like normal fish. And this is under normal oxygen conditions on one of our cruises. And then this is a video that we took under low oxygen conditions. And you can see in this video here in particular, in the background is a, um, beautiful piece of habitat for fish. Normally it would be loaded with fish. But in this case, we're in an area time, during time where the oxygen was very low. We only saw this one fish in the entire video and you can see he's kind of swimming slow, acting a little weird. And this next part is amazing. Look, look at the bottom of the screen as this fish is swimming along now. The crab comes out and attacks the fish and that is just not normal behavior. You could. The, the crab most likely saw that the fish was acting weirdly, wasn't in great condition, and so it tried to take advantage and actually eat the fish, which is not a normal behavior. It's actually a reversal of the food chain in this area. So these hypoxic events can cause major detrimental effects. Um, Another thing we're doing, as I mentioned, is working with commercial fishermen. They, we have them going out in between our cruises to collect data. And what this does for them is they now understand this linkage to hypoxia. And what they understand is that when there's low oxygen, they probably don't want to go out and go fishing. So they collect data. We produce plots like you're seeing here that we've trained them to look at. So you see this area here has lower oxygen. It's not that low. But if we saw that it was really low, they would know that that's not an area they want to fish in, giving them better information as well. So in conclusion, we found that hypoxia and red tide blooms co-occur in all the devastating blooms that have occurred since 2000. And this is really highlighted by 2005, 6, 2013, and 2017 to 19. With our partners, we've been able to really increase the amount of sampling we have in the area. We've really made some monumental strides in understanding what might be causing these blooms, might, what, what might lead to the blooms ending. And with all this, we are now starting to build the models and develop forecasts that we can test out and try to predict future red tide events. And I thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions that you may have. All right, thank you so much for that presentation, Chris. We do have a couple questions rolling into the chat. We'll get started. Rick is wondering if red tides are getting worse every year or are they just getting more media attention or do we not know yet? So we don't know yet. One of the big problems we have is we have a really long data set of red tides in Florida. It goes back to the 40s, 1940s, so almost 100 years. But that data is really collected when there's a red tide occurring, so it's really skewed towards when there's blooms happening. The other thing is, as times have changed, the way we, we look and score and observe red tide has changed. So back in the 40s, it was just whether a boat happened to cross a red tide. Now we have satellites in the sky all the time that can see these things. So we know better when red tides are occurring. So we're really still trying to investigate whether they're occurring or getting worse. One of the ways we've done this recently, which is through oral histories with some of these fishermen, especially the fishermen that have been in the system for a long time. And most of the oral histories do tend to indicate that conditions probably are getting worse. Not necessarily every year they're getting worse. It's kind of periodic when these devastating blooms occur but they definitely uh, in the oral histories came out that they feel it's, it's occurring more frequently than it used to when they were younger. Okay, thank you. And Nicholas in the chat is wondering, are red tides expected to worsen with climate change? That is a great question. Um, there's kind of conflicting, um, conflicting evidence there that we haven't been able to decipher well. So there's the two things going on is that with climate change, we expect nutrients to be more available and carbon to be more available, so that should promote their growth. However, the temperatures that might increase would actually negatively impact their growth, would slow down their growth, because they get it gets essentially too hot for them, and they don't, they don't grow as well under temperatures above about 32 Celsius. So, so about during the summertime here, they're already probably having some negative impacts from temperature. Under climate change, as you increase temperature, you would have those negative impacts. So we kind of have that having a negative impact, increased availability of nutrients and carbon having a positive impact and exactly how that play out, we're not, we're not certain yet. Okay, and Maya is wondering, are red tides only in Miami? 
No. So red tides, that's a great question. Red tides, uh, they occur in Miami very infrequently. They occur mostly from blooms on the west coast of Florida, around Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, Naples area, when they get transported by the ocean currents around to Miami. But they are throughout the entire Gulf of Mexico uh, with this particular species, it's, that's Karenia brevis. There's another species that occurs in Japan and yet another one that occurs in Europe that are the same uh, genus. So they're both the same Karenia. It's a type of dinoflagellate, very closely related. They're called red tides because they look the same to the human eye when they form these blooms. So they, they occur all over the Gulf of Mexico and they, even in some other countries. Okay, and last question from the chat. Greg is wondering if red tides are more prevalent in the spring or is there a certain time of year that they're more prevalent? Very good question. They are most prevalent actually in the late summer, early fall. About September, October is the typical peak for red tides. They tend to start in the summertime, peak September, October, and die down a bit in the wintertime. Usually December, January, February, they start to, to disappear. All right, great, thank you. And we have a couple more questions, but we are going to hold on to those and we're going to move on to our next speaker. So thank you so much, Chris, for your wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is Nicole, and she's going to dive into coral reefs for us. Nicole, I'm sending it over to you now. Awesome. And I think everyone can see me. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. My name is Nicole Bessemer, and I am the Caribbean Climate Operations Coordinator here at AOML. I've worked here for a little over a year and a half, and I first got my interest in marine biology really as a little kid. My dad is an avid recreational fisherman, and he's had me out on his boat since before I could even walk. So I'm super thankful now as an adult that I'm able to give back and help something that I care about so much, which is the ocean. And so today I am going to talk to you about climate impacts on coral reef ecosystems and how the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program tracks them. Oops, sorry about that. And so first I wanna give a little intro into what is a coral. Most people think they are just rocks sort of living on the bottom of the ocean, but they are actually animals that feed and reproduce just like animals on land. And so when you zoom in on a coral, sort of like this picture on the left here, you can see individual coral polyps. And then the picture on the right is a cartoon of what the anatomy looks like on the inside. So corals are in the phylum Cnidaria, and they are related to a jellyfish, which is kind of why the polyp looks like an upside down jelly. And so the cool thing about corals is they actually have a photosynthetic algae that live in their tissues and can actually provide energy for the coral, just like plants do on land. And it's also the algae that give them their unique colors. And so when we have multiple corals all living together, different species, we get coral reefs. And so why do we care so much about coral reefs? One, they're beautiful. There are a lot of people's favorite place to come visit when they go to the ocean. They are biodiversity hotspots. They offer coastal, offer coastal protection from storms. They are essential habitat for not only commercially important species, but also endangered species in the ocean. And they are a hotspot for tourism, as I mentioned. As a whole, they contribute roughly $4.4 billion to the US economy alone. And so while they are so important, they're actually really under threat. And one, there's a multiple threats to coral reefs, but one of the ones that I'm gonna talk about today is climate impacts. And so the first topic is temperature. Temperature is rising in our atmosphere, and so temperature, ocean, ocean temperatures are also rising. And so this increase in sea surface temperature is what causes coral bleaching, which is happening in this picture. And so when waters get too warm and the corals get stressed, they lose their relationship with that symbiotic photosynthetic algae, and it leaves behind sort of this calcium carbonate skeleton, which you can see here in the middle picture. Now, some corals can recover from this, but it is hard and can cause mass mortality as seen on the right. It has been said that temperature is one of the largest contributors and biggest threat uh, for coral reef survival. Next, we have uh, ocean acidification and carbon chemistry as a climate impact. And so it's well established that CO2 is rising in our atmosphere. And in true fashion, that means uh, CO2 in seawater is rising as well. 
And so when CO2 increases, a metric of the carbonate chemistry system called pH decreases. And a lower pH means more acidic. And so this is where the term ocean acidification actually comes from. And so just like how acid breaks things down on land, it actually does so in the sea. So this is especially important for animals and creatures that need to calcify, like crabs, lobsters, shellfish, and those coral skeletons, as we saw before. And so when the water becomes acidic, it can make it harder for the coral to grow and can break down the existing skeleton. This leads us to sort of the last way that we say climate impacts coral reefs, and it's described as the ecological impacts. So as temperature and ocean acidification sort of become bigger for these corals, the ecosystems suffer and they decline, and it has huge implications for the fish and other species that thrive on them, and then that ultimately affects us as humans. So it's really important that we're keeping track of this sort of ecology and looking at how the rate of change that's happening and how the reef is growing and calcifying or breaking down due to bio erosion. And so the project that was created to track all of these impacts is the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program. This was established in 2014 and it actually composes four independent monitoring projects to make up the whole program. We have benthic cover, co benthic cover monitoring, excuse me, fish population monitoring, socioeconomic monitoring component, and climate monitoring, which is the project that I'm talking about today. It's a huge multi-agency effort and it covers all uh, US nine jurisdictions with coral reefs. And so our group specifically is in charge of the Caribbean and Atlantic jurisdictions. So we travel to Flower Garden Banks, Dry Tortugas, we go throughout the Florida Keys, Puerto Rico, as well as St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix and the U.S. Virgin Islands to do this climate monitoring. To do this, we have a bunch of different instruments and techniques to collect the data. And so here is uh, an example of how we monitor temperature. And to do this, we use this instrument on the right here called a subsurface temperature recorder or an STR as I'll call it. These instruments are attached to the sea floor and they collect temperature readings every five minutes. So it's really high precision temperature data for climate quality work. We also deploy these instruments on a depth gradient so we can sort of get a full picture of what's really going on in these local reefs and what temperatures they're experiencing. And then so after this three year deployment, we collect the instruments, put new ones out and we download the data that looks like this. And so this is an example of data downloaded from an STR locally here in Miami and Biscayne National Park. And what's really cool is we get to see some sort of expected seasonal fluctuations between winter and summer, but we also get to see anomalies such as tropical storms and hurricanes that cause these sort of abnormal temperature fluctuations. Next way we monitor for climate impacts is looking at the OA and carbonate chemistry. And we actually do this in a couple different ways. So this picture up here is a map CO2 buoy, and this is deployed in the Florida Keys. And what this does is it actually takes real-time seawater chemistry measurements and then sends the data via satellite back to the lab. The other way we do this is actually just by collecting bottles of seawater sample right over here. This can be done on the surface, just from a boat or at depth, like in this picture here. And this helps us span a big, a larger area. Um, it's a lot easier to collect these water samples than deploy these buoys everywhere. And from there, we're actually able to get all five param parameters of the carbonate chemistry system that make up, that help us really track ocean acidification impacts on coral reefs. Lastly, to monitor the ecology, including the growth and erosion, we use these little instruments on the left here called bioerosion monitoring units, or BMUs. So these are pieces of calcium carbonate skeleton that actually go through a CT scanner, just like a doctor's office has. And then they are deployed on the reef for three years. And so after that three years, they actually represent what a part of the local reef looks like without taking a piece of living coral. And so we bring those back, we put them back through that CT scanner, and we're actually able to get volumetric measurements of the types of erosion inside, as well as density and compare these changes over the three years. And so the most important part of taking all this data is putting together these reports and these go to stakeholders, local managers, and they help them make decisions about their protected resources. So this is a snapshot from our most recent report where we took the monitoring data and we turned it into metrics of health. And so this report 
is actually showing that Florida's reefs are impaired and we need to figure out a way to help sort of bring these reefs back. And now it's not all doom and gloom as I'm sort of making it sound. Uh, as my colleague Anderson is about to talk about in the next talk, there are these little hot spots of sort of resilient corals and temperature resistant corals that sort of thrive and are maybe the key picture and to help the continuation of our coral reefs. I lastly just wanna highlight how many partners we use. As Chris mentioned, partnerships are so important in making all of this research happen and we would not be able to do it without them. If you're interested in learning more, just as I showed the picture from the Florida report, we actually have reports from all of our Atlantic jurisdictions as well as our jurisdictions in the Pacific. And there is a national port that just recently came out that compares the Atlantic and Pacific coral reefs as a whole. These are all available on the web and you can just Google search and download them to be able to read about your favorite reef. And with that, I will say thank you and just wanna give a shout out to our team. It takes an army to do this and we wouldn't be able to do this project without them. And I will take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much for that presentation, Nicole. And thank you to you and your team for all the hard work you do to keep our reefs nice and healthy. We have a lot of coral questions coming in in the chat, so I will try to get to all of them. Yeah. And let's start off uh, with, Nicholas is wondering, what is your favorite coral? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say I have two. Some of my previous work has been done with a cropper or cervicornis, so I love seeing the staghorn coral out. But I think one of the prettiest corals are some of our brain corals. Um, they're just really unique when you actually get to see them out on the reef. Very cool. And Greg is wondering, why are corals different colors? Yeah, so that actually goes back to that symbiotic algae that I was talking about. So like I said, it has a tissue and these different algaes live in the tissues. And so just like plants can be different colors, the algae in there is actually what's changing the corals to be different colors. So it's just really about the different type of algae that they have brings out the different colors in them. All right, and Teresa's wondering, when do corals tend to feed? At night or during the day? Is there a certain time that they're more active to feed? So they actually do it in both ways. So as I said, this photosynthetic algae is actually what's producing the energy during the day because it's able to take advantage of the sun. Whereas then at night, the uh, polyps and the actual tentacles that the coral has are able to grab the little pieces of food swimming around them. So they sort of do a little bit of both. All right, very cool. And Rick is wondering, once a coral reef bleaches, is there a chance that it'll be able to come back to life? There definitely is. Um, I will be honest with you, I don't know if I know the percentage off the top of my head of what percentage of reefs recover or don't. Um, it is possible, but I do know that it does often lead to mortality versus recovery. Sounds good. Maybe we'll ask Anderson the same question. He might be able to tell us a little bit more about tolerant corals. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another audience member is wondering, have you ever studied any deep water corals or corals that rely more on a heterotrophic feeding mechanism? So I haven't personally, but one of our lab members, uh, Dr. Michael Studevin, who I believe is a part of the Q&A tomorrow, he has worked with deep metaphotics reefs and he's very interested in expanding that research further in our lab. And it's definitely something I'm really excited about. I think it definitely has some really cool implications for the future of reefs. Very cool. I'm sure we'll hear Michael talk more about that tomorrow. Yep. And let's see. Somebody else in the chat is wondering, what is the best part about researching coral reefs? Um, I think the best part is honestly being able to go out in the field. And now it's a little bit, you know, marine biologists, you think we're diving all the time and we're really not. I sit most of my time in my office. But when I do actually get to go out in the field diving, we get to actually swap these instruments. And we, you know, when we bring them back, we get this cool new data. Um, I just think it's being able to get out there and really see everything. It's not everyone gets that opportunity. So I definitely do not take it for granted. I'm sure, I'm sure it's very fun. And last question, Nikki is wondering what you would suggest for a recent college grad if they want to get involved in coral research. Are there any opportunities that you could suggest them getting involved in? Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's, so the best thing that I would do, I guess it depends really where you are, but reach out to your local universities, look up if there's any local opportunities with either you know some sort of conservation programs if you have that availability there's a lot of citizen science programs that sometimes allow for coral research 
um, the best way to do is just sort of put your name out there and find, you know, follow the Coral List, follow these different groups on social media, and there's always opportunities out there. So getting your name out there as best as possible is going to be the best way to get into the field. Awesome. That sounds like great advice. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Nicole. And I'm going to hand it over to our next speaker, Anderson. And he's going to tell us a little bit about some resilient and more tolerant corals to these changing environments. Over to you, Anderson. All right. Let's see. Does that look okay? Looks great. All right, well, happy everybody. My name is Anderson Mayfield. I'm a scientist working at AOML. And um, I'm actually really glad that I'm go getting to go after Nicole now. because She's already done a lot of the legwork talking to you about kind of some coral reef basics and things like that. And I can kind of dive in into a little bit more detail about what makes corals tick. Um, I have almost 20 years of research experience in corals. My background is actually in the Asia Pacific. Um, like most people, I got into this because of a love of diving. And I was mainly been focused on basic research, experiments, field work, lab work, things like that. And I still really enjoy those things. But I think because of these issues that Nicole mentioned facing coral reefs, I'm trying to dedicate more and more of my time as years go by into kind of not just doing the science, but also trying to get a little bit more involved in um, conservation issues. Um, basically, I have kind of a four pronged approach for studying corals. I, I, I love diving, so I'm doing a lot of field work, um, but I also like the technology aspect. So I think you've, you've heard in both of the previous talks, this, this kind of developing tools, employing them in the field, forecasting. These are things that make sense for hurricane research, for oceanographic patterns, for harmful algal blooms. So now I'm trying to take that same idea and applying it to coral. Can we go out there with all these gobs of data we've been collecting and not just track the health of coral like Nicole has been talking about, but take the next step and start trying to forecast what's going to happen in the future. Um, so I and one of the things I like about this is because I think marine biologists have done a good job of raising these issues, but sometimes they can tend to be a little bit too doom and gloom. And I think that could be dangerous because if you're only telling people how bad things are out there, it's not going to make them want to change their behavior. So I think, you know, hopefully at, by the end of this talk, you, re you realize you, you learn that yes, quarries are threatened, but there are reasons for hope and one of those reasons are these heat tolerant corals. So just like any organism or just like people, not all corals are created equal. So we know when you just look at all the different types of corals out there, um, overall branching corals like this one here from the Philippines, they tend to bleach, get sick, they tend to basically um, show less resilience than what we call massive so this doesn't necessarily mean these corals are bigger. Massive in this coral sense more tends to mean just bolder ones. So this is a, um, a markedly healthy reef in the Florida Keys where you see a lot of bolder corals. They tend to be more resilient than the branching ones. But even within the different coral morphologies or within the species, you see this heterogeneity as well. Some populations are stronger than others. Some genotypes are stronger than others. You can even see this situation. These corals are likely brother and sister. They might even be twins with identical DNA. But for whatever reason, that one on the left maybe got too hot, maybe was exposed to um, some other stressor like ocean acidification. It bleached to a much greater extent than the one on the right, despite potentially a very similar environment. So these are the kind of situations when I'm out there diving that really kind of pique my interest. What is that coral on the right doing differently? Or what is it doing that, the, that its sister, for instance, is not doing? Um, we see this in, in humans as well. So, you know, what are the, so my questions have more to do with what are the drivers of this resilience? What can we learn from it? And can we go out there and try to 
use our data to say, hey, based on this information, I'm thinking we're going to find the resilient corals on this reef, or maybe we're going to find the weak ones over here. And then we're going to be able to do um, something I'll talk about in a minute, which I call coral reef triage. So, you know, you've heard a little bit about um, our field work, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, we're working in, in more of the U.S. side now. This is actually a picture from Indonesia. But you do need to go out there and do the routine survey work. It's, it's fun. I enjoy it. Um, but if you just swim over this reef, um, you may not know which corals are going to be the winners and which ones are going to be the losers. You're going to need to take some samples. Um, in the meantime, you've heard, you know, when you're on those reefs, you're also going to want to know something about the environment. Maybe the corals aren't actually that special. Maybe the water is just really clean or has a lot of food. So you've heard a, a bit about our, our um, really extensive seawater quality monitoring. Um, but we, what you haven't heard as much about is what we're doing with these little biopsies of corals we're taking. And I do want to emphasize little because I don't want to give people the idea that, we, you know, we do sometimes take large, you know, cores to do growth analyses. But these little biopsies I'm taking to, to make guesses about coral health are really small. So not having to kill, go out there and kill corals to get these data. Um, and we have a nice little fleet of boats we can use to, to do our field work in South Florida. So for those of you who may not be local, AOML is basically just above where you see South Miami written on this map, um, Virginia Key. Hour, hour and a half drive is going to put you in squarely in the upper Florida Keys off Isla Morada. And this is, these are some of the sites we've worked the most extensively. And what you see is this really distinct gradient between the inshore reefs and the offshore reefs. Inshore reefs, which have murkier, turbid waters that you may not want to, you know, go spend your vacation diving on, they have these big, beautiful, robust, heat-tolerant corals, particularly this one species, the mountain. If you go offshore, it's kind of a paradox, you see these, this nice Caribbean blue water, um, great diving conditions much of the year, but the corals are just these little green patches you see. Most of them have died off because of elevated temperatures and disease. We didn't, haven't talked as much about disease, but coral disease is a rampant issue in South Florida as well. So, this is kind of a great natural laboratory because we've got these sites like Chica Rocks and the Rocks, which are less than a, you know a mile away from these offshore sites like Crockery and um, Little Car. Corals are doing so much better, and of course, yes, there is an environmental difference. The inshore reefs probably have more food, a little bit higher nutrients, despite the marginalized conditions. So there's definitely an environmental factor, and we transplant these corals back and forth tease that apart. But there's still something going on in the corals themselves. So here what we're trying to do is tease apart nature and nurture. We've got these healthier corals on the inshore reefs, these more stress susceptible offshore. And if you want to get some really nice images of Chica Rocks in particular, it's a National Marine Sanctuary. I definitely would encourage you to check out their website. Um, so I liken these corals of Chica rocks, the rocks, and if our field site is my patients, I kind of think of myself as like an actuary. These corals are sessile as adults, they don't move, which is bad because they can't escape if there's a heat wave, but it's good for science because it means I can go out there and tag them, I can go diving on those reefs whenever the conditions are, are suitable, and I can see what happens. And I can go back in time and say, hey, I sampled that coral in December and it was showing odd behavior. It led me to believe it might be stress sensitive. Or maybe I saw some signature in that coral in its tissues that was giving me some indication that it was going to be really resilient. And a lot of this has to do with lab. So we will take in little pieces of those big coral colonies I showed you, into our really nice lab we have across the street at the University of Miami. And then we don't have to worry about, you know, fluke 
events like hurricanes or things like that that get compromised, you know, your field work. We can control one factor at a time, be it temperature, PCO2, and we can see how these corals respond. So we'll have the field component. We know what these corals are doing in situ, and then we know how they're responding to the various stressors. And then we have what we call fate tracking data. We know how these corals physiology has changed over time. Um, how do we know whether a coral that's maybe visibly very normal looking is healthy or not is actually my main research focus. So if you went back to these very first corals I showed, six months before that one on the left got sick, you're probably, it's probably gonna look identical to the one on the right. So we're trying to develop something akin to a biomarker panel. So when you go have your blood drawn, maybe you feel totally fine, but you, a few days later, you get your blood report back and they say, hey, you've got a really high cholesterol level or really high blood sugar. You may not have any symptoms yet. You may feel totally healthy, but that kind of molecular data can actually give some insight into how you're going to be doing in the next few months. And this is basically what we're trying to develop. So Nicole will talk to you a little bit about our the technologies we're developing. We have a new automated ways of sampling seawater that have that are really revolutionized how marine biology is done. You've seen um, our state-of-the-art CAT scan. And what you haven't heard as much about is our molecular research, which is what I'm doing. That's what I was just talking about. Looking inside of the coral tissues and cells to see if we can detect aberrant behavior. Could be aberrant behavior in a good way. It could be something those corals are doing that makes them really strong, or it could be, you know, a subtle um, indication of stress response. So what we have the power of doing is taking what I call really a holistic approach to assessing coral health from the molecular level to the polyp to the colony all the way up to the ecosystem scale so Nicole showed you you know we've got a big team 16 20 of us now working on all facets of coral biology so we have this really unique opportunity to look at the coral health at all these different biological scales so blab to you for 10 minutes already what's what's what happened why are these corals and the insurance reef so strong to not get too much into the detail, it's having to do with their cellular biology. They're using different proteins from their breath, their offshore brethren. It's allowing them to essentially be stress hard. Their, have, their biology is fundamentally altered to where they can survive at higher temperatures than these corals offshore. And so for people that want to you know, farm corals or genetically modified corals, you're going to want to gravitate towards these inshore mountain star corals because they're, what's going on in their cells is telling you something about what it takes to survive in the next millennium. And you're going to hear more about kind of the DNA side of some of our molecular research, albeit not with corals, in the next talk to get a little bit more insight into our molecular. Basically, what I really want to do with these data is, you know, if you remember that report that Nicole showed where she's showing kind of a, a report card for the coral reef, she's, they're looking more at the ecosystem scale, the, including the fish, the algae, how much coral. I'm looking at the scale of the individual. So think of me more like a physician. I'm looking at, all right, are my patients healthy? You know, is are my patients over here in Isla Morada? Maybe they're I'm going to give them an A. They passed. Maybe my patients over near Key Largo are faring poorly. I'm going to give them an F based on these molecules I'm measuring in their cells. And this is important because before we didn't really know what's going on in the cells of a healthy or resilient coral. So we didn't really know what's kind of a normal range for a coral. So we basically had only measured the health of dying corals before. But now that we have kind of this benchmark of what it means or what a healthy coral looks like, 
we're going to be able to take this information and go elsewhere. So we're going to be able to go out there to a reef maybe we don't routinely go to, take a few coral samples, look at our biomarker panel and say, hey, based on this coral's you know, protein concentrations, it looks like those really strong corals that Anderson found at Cheek Rocks. So we're going to think, we're going to hypothesize that that coral is actually really healthy. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe we go somewhere down near Key West, for instance, take some samples, and we say, wow, those corals are well outside of the normal range of a healthy coral. Maybe we need to set up, maybe we need to try to improve the water quality there or reduce fishing pressures. It's going to allow us to do what I called earlier this coral reef triage. And the, and the situation where maybe we don't have the resources or the finances to go out there and save everything, this, these data will at least show us where we need to focus our efforts. And you might say, hey, this reef is too far gone. It's a bunch of stressed out corals. Maybe we just let it go and focus our effort on this super resilient reef. I'm not actually even sure where I stand on that, but I want to be able to produce the data and the kind of forecast that you would need to make those kinds of decisions. Um, so with that, I'll end my talk and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anderson. Fascinating presentation. And the questions are rolling into the chat. People are very curious about corals. We're gonna start off with, Greg is wondering, where in the world do you find the most healthy corals? Hmm. I did a really big research expedition across the Indo-Pacific, and we basically found that we saw a lot of really beautiful coral reefs, so i just say that. Most corals were showing signs of a stress response, which is worrisome. Honestly, now I tend to more want to focus my efforts on corals such as these inshore reefs of the Florida Keys, or even in the Port of Miami, which I didn't mention, we have a really exciting research project led by Ian Enox at, at AOML on these corals living in waters of downtown Miami that are just, you would not want to swim at all. And these corals, we've accidentally made them super strong. So I won't, healthy is kind of a, I want to put that in quotes, but in some strange instances, we've accidentally made stronger corals. And I think, I don't want to say that, you know, on a global scale, we've definitely done more harm than good. But I think some of these corals that we inadvertently stress hardened might actually be some of the most robust. If you want to, if, if, to answer a slightly different question, the most beautiful coral reefs are in Indonesia but I don't know if they're the most resilient yet. I've got samples, but I just, they're, they've been on the back burner. All right, and Rick is wondering, how far offshore does a reef need to be to be considered uh, an offshore reef? Ah, that's a great question. And it totally depends on the part of the world you're in. And we actually, you know, you can be in the Florida Keys and sit there, you know, surrounded by water. You can get a sense of where the reefs are from marker buoys and whatnot. And you might sit, say, am I offshore or inshore? Um, has a little bit to do with the oceanography, a little bit to do with how the reefs are structured. So I would say it's, it's very dependent on, on the area. There's no hard and fast rule to say, all right, 500 feet from the coast is an inshore reef, 1,000 feet from the coast is an offshore reef. All right, and Teresa is wondering, are SPFs and glitters harming corals that get into the water? I, even though it's not my area of expertise, I do keep an, you know, kind of an ear on the microplastics and the other pollutants out there and I am pretty much anything that's going into the water that shouldn't be there is a concern to me. Is it going to, you know, is it going to exacerbate the effects of climate change? I'm not sure yet, 
but I would definitely say it's not going to be anywhere near as significant as climate change. Could it act in concert with climate change to maybe do some undue harm? Possibly, but I would say, say tend to say that it would, on the stressor scale, it's going to be quite a few notches down. All right, good to know. And Maya is wondering, when a coral is bleached, are they always white or do they change into another color? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And one thing Nicole said, it's everything she said was true, but I will say to get back to coral color, corals do um, produce their own pigments as well. So not some of them will actually, some of the corals I've studied before will fluoresce green and purple as they're dying. And that becomes more prominent once the algae, which are more of a brownish hue, leave. So to the untrained eye, you see this neon green fluorescent purple reef is actually super beautiful. But basically it's a death response. Because that means you're essentially seeing the coral's true colors. You do not want to see the coral's true colors because that means it's algae that's left. So some corals do have their own pigments, and usually you want to be, you do not want to see their pigments because it means something's gone wrong. So if you go see a fluorescent green or a fluorescent purple reef, it's probably a bad thing, even though it is actually pretty green. All right, very interesting. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Anderson, and we are going to kick it off to our final presenter, Nastasia, and she's going to be talking a little bit about ocean forensics with us. All right, great. Thank you, Heidi. Everyone else, um, is my screen? There we go. It's great to be with you all today. I'm really excited to wrap up this, um, this webinar. Oh, share my webcam. There we go. Um, yeah, it's great to wrap up this this AOML webinar. We've had some really um, awesome talks so far, and hopefully I can end it with a bang um, on the topic of, of ocean forensics. I'll be talking about how eDNA and omics are tools for detection and conservation. And if you don't know what eDNA or omics mean right now, hopefully by the end of this talk, you will know what they mean and also why they're so cool and how we're using them in the ocean. So just to introduce myself first, my name is Nastasia Patton, and I have only been with AOML for about six months since last August. Um, but I am a postdoctoral researcher there, also associated with the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies at the University of Miami. Um, but I'm physically stationed actually in La Jolla, California. Um, this uh, photo on the bottom right is the view from the NOAA office building in La Jolla. Um, and so I do a lot of interacting over Zoom as we all have done this last year um, with my colleagues at AOML. But my main research interests include marine microbial ecology. I'm actually a microbiologist by training. And over the last few years, I've gotten more focused on eDNA um, and bioinformatics, both of which I will be telling you about uh, in this talk. And I also love to scuba dive, and I'm lucky enough to do that for some of my, some of my work. So just to start off, what is eDNA? So the E stands for environmental. And environmental DNA just comes uh, literally from the environment. So in the case of the ocean, it's floating around in the water, coming from cells that animals and plants and other organisms have shed as they are just going about their, their business. And um, so we can collect it straight from the environment rather than having to sample each and every um, organism, you know, rather than sampling from a fish, for example, the other fish DNA, we can just filter the water. And if a fish has been there, we might be lucky enough to get some of its DNA. And so just to even step, take a step back further, um, make sure we're all on the same page about what DNA is and where it comes from. We know that all of us, all animals, are made up of many, many thousands and millions of cells. Um, and at each of these cells, we have a copy of our genome. 
our chromosome, which is made up of lots and lots of DNA. Uh, and this would be kind of a rendering of what DNA might look like close up, just a short piece of it. But if you imagine um, uh, a bunch of that tightly wound up in each and every single one of your cells. And so when we lose cells and when fish and sharks in the ocean lose cells, they're also losing their DNA. And that's what we're collecting um, when we collect eDNA. And so DNA, you know, this is the classic double helix form that it takes. And within the double helix, there are nucleotide base pairs that match up to each other. So there are four nucleotides that make up DNA, A's, T's, C's, and G's. I'm not gonna worry about what they, what they stand for, but basically when we unravel this DNA and look at the um, order of these nucleotides, we can get the sequence. And that sequence can be really specific to uh, genes, um, to individuals, to populations, depending on what section of DNA we're looking at. And that'll become important when I talk a little bit more about how we use eDNA. But first, how do we actually sample eDNA from the ocean? Uh, well, the first step is collecting a lot of water. Uh, it actually doesn't have to be that much. Usually, usually a liter um, is enough for what we want to do. But it does depend if we're looking for something that's very rare or if there's not um, a lot of, like if we're in the open ocean where there's not a ton of, of biomass floating around, then we might do up to 10 liters. We filter that water to concentrate all of the cells and DNA and particles um, that DNA sticks to. And then we take that filter and we take it to the lab um, and we process it for DNA. We do a chemical extraction process where we get rid of all the other gunk um, that's in these cells and just get our pure DNA. And the photo on the right is uh, me holding up a, a filter that is, has some very precious eDNA sample on it. And that's a typical kind of filter. It's like a little cylinder um, with outlets at both ends so we can um, easily attach tubing and, and filter water really efficiently onto it. And so once we have our pure extracted eDNA, then we can prepare it for sequencing and get the actual uh, nucleotide sequences of the DNA in there. And then we have to take those sequence data and analyze them in a, a field called bioinformatics, which is basically um, a mix of statistics and biology, um, where we try to parse out what sequences belong to what organisms and what genes. And, um, and the photo on the bottom is just a, a kind of a chaotic scene on a filtering on a boat, um, trying to filter as fast as possible so DNA doesn't degrade. And so um, as samples are coming in, trying to filter as, as fast as possible. So, okay, so we know eDNA, we know bioinformatics. What is omics? Uh, this other term that I, I had in my title. So omics is, is a term that includes a lot of different things. It started, I think it started with the term genomics, um, which is looking at one genome made up of DNA. We can also look at things like RNA or proteins or small molecules, metabolites, and these have their own omics um, field associated with them as well. So we can get transcript omics for RNA, proteomics for proteins. Um, so these all kind of fall under, under omics. And those, traditionally, those refer to uh, molecules from one organism. We would look at all the proteins in one particular organism. But when we go into the environment, we can make it meta, and we can say that eDNA becomes now metagenomics because we're looking at a bunch of different genomes from all the different things that are in the environment. We're not just looking at one fish genome or one um, shark genome. Same thing for metatranscriptomics, for RNA, and so on. It gets really complicated. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but just know that all of these terms kind of fall under the umbrella of omics, and at AOML, we're mostly working with um, DNA and metagenomics, but um, certainly there's there's been some great work done with marine um, systems doing transcriptomics and proteomics and metabolomics as well. Okay, but back to DNA, um, which is really my main my main field of focus um, in this term bioinformatics, which is where we take the DNA sequences, the language that is made up of A's, T's, C's, and G's, and we try to make sense of them. And the main way we do this for eDNA is by looking at genes that are part of every living thing, every cell in every type of organism, all the way from bacteria to whales, have these genes because they're required for cells just to basically function, to, to survive and to replicate. 
And these genes that are part of every cell have evolved over time with that organism. So if you can imagine, um, you know, as, as fish and sharks evolved over time, their genes change slightly. That's what makes them different um, in different species. And so we can take those gene sequences and use them as barcodes for different species. And so just to sort of conceptualize this a little bit, if you think about this double helix of DNA, we've unraveled it, we've looked at the nucleotide sequence, and now we can take that particular sequence and try to match that barcode sequence with the species of interest. So to, to maybe diagram this out in a little more, um, uh, little more visually pleasing way, if we think about this, this you know, community of the ocean, which has so many different things swimming around in it, living in it, um, shedding cells and shedding DNA, the whole process, start to finish, is again, we filter our water, we extract our DNA, and then we just look at these particular genes that all cells have. We just chop out this, this one little section, and we get basically a big list of all the genes that are in there. and They're all slightly different from each other. And then we can take those genes and match them up in a, this barcoding fashion um, to the different organisms that we know match up to the sequence um, that we saw. And so the same way a detective might go to a crime scene and get a, a DNA sample and match that DNA sample with a particular individual human, we're doing the exact same thing here, except instead of individual um, humans or, or organisms, we can get them at the population level or at the species level. Um, and we can say, we can say this is a shark specific um, gene or barcode. And so, and so once again, we have our nucleotide sequences that are made up of these four base pairs. We match, we make that a barcode that is specific to that species. And then we can say, okay, based on this eDNA in this ocean, in this particular part of the ocean, we have a shark, we have a copepod, and we have a sea star. And that's what we get from our environmental um, DNA sample. So why, why would we want to do this? How would we use eDNA? There, there are a lot of different ways we can use eDNA. Um, the first way would be to look for animals that are hard to track in other ways, like visually or auditorily. Maybe they're really rare um, and we just don't see them very often, you know, by scuba diving or from the surface of a boat. And so, you know, e using eDNA from a water sample might be the best way to know if that species is there or not. We can also use it to detect invasive species. So things that should not be in that um, in that habitat, but maybe have been introduced by humans, but it's definitely um, a really important thing to know, especially as we track the spread of inv invasive species. We can detect endangered species that might also, again, be really rare, and we want to know if they're actually still out there. And we can try to conduct population surveys without actually sampling and um, disturbing the animals themselves as they live and, um, you know, Doing their, doing their thing in the ocean. And so just as an example of this, this figure on the right is from a study from a few years ago. Um, I was not involved with this study, but I think it's a nice example of how eDNA can be compared to other more traditional methods of um, looking for marine organisms. So in this case, the study authors were interested in sharks and they used three different methods to look for sharks. Um, the first is what they called BRUVs at the bottom. It just meant um, cameras that were that were baited, um, and so they were hoping a shark would swim by and they would get a photo of it. The second was this um, UVC, I think underwater visual something, where basically as a diver, they would go out and do surveys um, in person and they would write down what they saw underwater. And then the third way was using eDNA. And what you can see, um, eDNA being represented by this red circle, is that most of the shark species that they found in this study were found by eDNA. There were just a couple. case studies 
The first one is um, a research effort that I'm going to be involved in, uh, literally starting next week. I'm going to be getting on this boat to take part in this um, biannual rockfish survey off the coast of California. And I'm just showing here a typical way these fish surveys are done. So every night for several weeks, they put out nets, they trap a bunch of fish, um, or in this case, looks like a bunch of little squid. And then they manually by hand sort out all the different fish and squid and whatever else they catch. And they just count things by hand, by eye. And they do this every night um, you know, for a few weeks. And it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, and um, you end up killing a lot of fish. And so what if we can use eDNA to do these population surveys instead? Um, how much time and effort and money could we, could we um, minimize by not having to do these surveys? And you know, all these fewer little squid that no longer have to be um, caught and you know, die in the line of duty here. And then the other case study I wanted to talk about is deep sea environments. These are environments that are very, very difficult to sample. It, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of really complicated, expensive equipment to go down 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 meters um, down to the deep sea. And you know, to put cameras down there is a huge endeavor. And so collecting water samples and looking for the inhabitants of the deep sea using eDNA is a really promising field um, that could, could teach us a lot about what inhabits these really hard to reach environments, hard to observe environments, um, and help us understand what's going on down there. So that is just a little primer on eDNA and omics and bioinformatics. Um, I hope that was all clear, but if it wasn't, um, please feel free to ask me any questions. I'm happy to answer any that you might have. Thank you so much, Nastasia. That was so interesting. We have a couple of questions coming in. And let's see, Rick is wondering, are there any reefs like we find in Florida and California? Um, short answer is no, they're not, they're not the same kinds of reefs. There are rocky reefs um, and there are corals, but the water on the west coast is much colder. Um, we get a lot of upwelling in California, which brings cold, deep water up from, from the depths. And um, so people will often be surprise they'll come here in August or July they want to go in the ocean and the and the water's like 60 degrees <laughs> and so um the the things that live out here are more cold adapted um so there are some corals but they're they're not at all like the ones you find in in Florida all right and Nicholas is wondering how long does it take to sequence and analyze all of the eDNA that you collect in a sample Oh, I love that question. Uh, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, it can take it can take a long time. Um, the sequencing itself doesn't really take that long, uh, but it depends if you have to send it out like to a company, which is the most common way of doing it. Um, then it can take a few weeks. I would say is pretty common. The analysis side uh, depends a lot on the type of eDNA you're looking at and what you're looking for. If it's just the kind of meta barcoding type that I talked about, that's pretty quick. Um, there are some really great computer programs out there that can take the raw data and kind of process it all the way to like your, your list of organisms. Um, we can do that pretty efficiently. And actually there are people at AOML that are working on those programs and tools trying to make it easier for scientists to do that. Um, but overall, start to finish, an eDNA project can easily take six to 12 months, I would say. So it's, it's a lot of work. And yeah, that's a long time. And Greg is wondering, do you ever find human eDNA in your samples? Oh yeah, definitely, all the time. Yeah, it's a big concern. I mean, we, we get concerned about contamination a lot. We really wanna make sure that what we're seeing in our samples is just what came from the water and nothing else. And um, human DNA is obviously the biggest source of contamination because you know, you're constantly handling the samples and um, so we, you know, as microbiologists, we've been trained in kind of sterile techniques where, as we know now with COVID too, you know, people are becoming more familiar with this um, idea of not transmitting bacteria, viruses, germs, and even DNA from surface, you know, one surface to another. And so, you know, we're constantly using gloves, changing out gloves, sterilizing surfaces. Um, it's, it's a big concern. But in general, I would say it's rare that we get a huge amount of human DNA contamination. Um, more likely you get things like fit, you know, other fit, contamination from other samples, from other um, 
or especially if you're on a fisheries boat, there's so many dead fish around, that's a big source of contamination. Um, but the, the, the answer is yes, and we do what we can to minimize that. Okay, very interesting. And we have gone a little bit over time. So if you have any more questions about ocean forensics or eDNA, Nastasia's email is right on the screen there. You can also email us at aoml.communications at noaa.gov if you have any further questions. As we wrap up today, I'm going to invite everybody to come back on the screen just so we can all say goodbye. And I want to thank all of our wonderful presenters uh, today for giving their talks. I also want to thank our attendees for coming in and enjoying this webinar with us. Just a reminder that tomorrow, April 23rd, is our career panel Q&A. Our panel members are going to be talking about their experiences working with NOAA, how they got to where they are today, and of course, answering any of your questions. So you can register for tomorrow's webinar using the link that's on the screen. It's bit.ly slash AOML goes virtual dash Q&A. Keep in mind that Bitly links are case sensitive. Um, we will also be posting these links on our website as well as our social media, which you can find us here at aoml.noaa.gov slash outreach and education. And of course, online, our Twitter and Instagram handles are at NOAA underscore AOML. So we thank you again for being with us tonight and we hope you join us tomorrow to wrap everything up. Have a good night, everybody.